can still see the steeple A little church on the hill There was a line at the altar Every pew had been filled I remember the water Choir singing on hills There was peace in the valley
Good morning, Refuge Community Church. How are you guys doing today? All of you guys, thank God you guys made it here. Please be careful going home today because this is not the day to be stuck on the side of a road. Um, but we thank you for being here because the word of God will never be impeded upon that. It can't be preached wherever it is being preached. So, we well, are already up on your feet. I don't even have to tell you anymore. Jeez. Before we do that, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. Thanks for lifting us all together this morning. Um, we just ask, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts. That you would help each one of us to just put aside all of the thoughts and anxieties and everything that happened this week and everything that's going to be happening. And that we would just focus our hearts and our minds on you. God, we pray that you would um, move in our lives today, God, that you would um, inhabit our praise as we as we sing this morning, and um, that you would illuminate your word, God, that you would um, use Pastor Don, and that you would anoint him and give him the words, Father, that you want us to hear, that you would change us and mold us more and more into the image of Christ. And Father, as we look ahead to the, the really cold weather coming, we just, um, we ask uh, for extra protection for those people that work outside, um, those people that don't have homes and that are looking for shelter, for um, just all of all of your creation, God, as we kind of buckle down for this cold weather. We just ask for your protection. Um, we give you this day, we give you this time, and we pray that you would um, be lifted up and glorified in Jesus' name. Children singing glory, glory, 
unforgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love how can it be that you my king should die for me amazing love I know it's true it's my joy to honor you and all I do to honor you I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love how can it be that you my king should die for me amazing love I know it's true it's my joy to honor you in all I do to honor you you
So we're excited about the Wednesday classes that are starting on January 31st. We've got several. We're right now in a group called Love and Chaos, but on January 31st, we're going to break into several classes, and we just want to kind of whet your appetite for what's coming up on the 31st. We're going to have three classes. We're going to have this group, which we just teased, which is uh, Faith Foundations, but we're also going to be offering two others, Disciple, and then we're going to go back into Grief Share for 13 weeks. So be ready for those. We're going to have some opportunities for you to see the other two, Disciple and Grief Share, over the next couple of weekends. Um, as I mentioned, Love and Chaos is wrapping up the last couple of weeks over the next two Wednesdays, and you're welcome to join us for those last couple of weeks. Monday, we're going to have a game day on Martin Luther King Day because school is out. So 6th through 12th grade are going to be here from 12 to 3. Most of you, if not all of you, are outside of that age group. But if you have an opportunity to be here, there's going to be things for you to do to give your lives away to help those kids prepare. So just, um, just if you want to serve, if there's stuff to do, check with Eddie, be here between 9 and 12, and come back after 3. There's going to be stuff for you to do. We want you to be a part of our 12-month uh, uh, Bible reading plan, uh, the Bible in a year. You can scan that QR code, and you can also go online. It's on our web page, on our front page, as well as our resources page, and you can uh, be a part of that. The Never Say Dive is open now. There's some wrinkles that are coming up on Friday nights. We just want to make you aware of that. So just we want to love these people well and just be praying for this group that's opened this bar. They're serving food. They're in our neighborhood, and we just want to love them well. So you've already got your Bible app notification. If you, if you want to open that, it's Romans 15, 7 through 13. If not, if you've got your paper Bible, open to Matthew, or sorry, Romans 15, 7 through 13. Pastor Don's going to bring us the word. made it. It was kind of cold out there today, wasn't it? I was driving at 8 o'clock in the morning, and when you get out to Grafton and you go across that field, yeah, it's cold. So those of you that are here, you're the, you're the warm saints that battled through to get here, and I hope some of you on uh, Facebook Live or, you know, we're on YouTube, whatever it's called anymore, are watching and connected. That's one of the reasons it's nice to have that tool for those that can't make it out. But I want to talk today about the word hope. Now, how many of you were hoping that the Browns would not do what they did yesterday? Yeah, another year. Yeah, there's always next year in Cleveland, Ohio. That's not the hope we're going to talk about today. The talk that we're going to talk about is the real hope. The hope that Jesus offers, that only Jesus can offer. And we're going to be in a, in a prayer time, if you will, in this section is Paul is wrapping this section up a little. He's been talking about the strong. He's been talking about the weak. And now he's going to talk about that unity concept a little bit more. Because I think people forget why they come to church. I think there's this teaching, there's this thinking, and it permeates our society that we come to church because we come to things we want. And it has nothing to do with us anymore. It never did. It has to do with Jesus Christ and us meeting him and then wanting to bring others together so we can be united in Jesus. Not united in theories, not united in paintings, not united in translation, but united in a person. And if you look at the church, it's so wide, it's so diverse, and that's what he's wrestling with all throughout this chapter 14 and 15, is how different these people are. And we need to unite. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So join me in verse 7, we're going to read 7 to 13. Therefore, remember, whenever we see that word therefore, we go back and we look, and that's where we talked about the strong and the weak. Receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision 
for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, For this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentile, in him the Gentiles shall hope. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we have a building to gather in and we have a place where we can meet and we can have music proclaimed, we can have your word read, we can preach your word, we can serve your community, we can reach out, Lord. But Lord, let us never think that those things are why we gather. Lord, we gather to bring glory to your name. We gather to admit to one another, Lord, that you have rescued us from ourselves. You have saved us, Lord. And Lord, we want to extend that opportunity for others to come into our body, Lord, as we get conformed into the image of your Son. So Father, grant us wisdom. Grant us knowledge. Grant us trust in you, not in man, Lord. Lord, we want to walk together in the good days and we want to walk together in the hard days as we as a family of Christ that has been called on this corner of Broadview and Natchez show the world how to stay focused on you and how to do life together. Lord, I lift up those that are dealing with physical ailments now. We think of Wally with her kidney. We think of Linda who's been recovering from surgery. Dawn with a migraine. Lord, the list I'm sure goes on much more than that. Lord, we know you're with them in all those different locations. And Lord, we pray that we can praise you in the midst of those things. Let, it, let us take our minds off our circumstances and onto you. But we can't do that without the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. In our flesh, it's always about us. But when we're in the Spirit, it's about you. So, Father, I pray that this word uh, that has been shared, that this preaching will go to your word and we will take it and we will go out and use it in this world. Because, Lord, the time is short, but there are souls at stake. In Jesus' name, amen. It's so important that you and I understand what the purpose of church is. And really, there's only two purposes in all of church, if you think about it. The first purpose is if you're born again and you have been rescued, to go rescue other people. That is the number one job that all Christians are supposed to be doing, is going and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, because he saved you, and you know how messed up you were, that person next to you can be saved too. Then the second thing that is equally as important is once you're saved, getting connected in a local body and being discipled. Because when you get saved, you come with your baggage. You ever notice that? You come, he doesn't say check it all at the door, throw your mind away. He says come as you are. And the more you walk with Christ, I hope the more you realize how selfish you are. I know I do. If you honestly say, I don't really feel like I'm ever selfish then I'd want you to kind of look at what these people were dealing with because this is exactly what's going on because the Jews wanted a Christian to be one way, the Gentiles wanted a Christian to be another way, and Christ in the churches come and says, no, they're to be together. They're to be united in me. And, And we go into all these crazy theories. They were wrestling at this time because if you go back, they were trying to get Gentiles to be Jews. Well, it was important Because what do we do now in the church age? We don't even want to mention Israel anymore. We're like, oh, the church has replaced Israel. It has not. (laughs) There was a distinct purpose for the church, and there's a distinct purpose for the Israelites, and we're in this period of time right now where most of the people that are getting saved are Gentiles. 
Anybody here got Jewish roots? Okay. That's the norm here in Northeast Ohio, which means you're all Gentiles. I am a Gentile as well, which means that prior to Jesus' death on the cross, and really until we get to Acts 8, Jesus wasn't focused on us yet. He was focused on the Jews. Now, all throughout Old Testament, that's what we're going to be looking at, the Gentiles were still coming and getting close. There was them building relationships, so don't think that God didn't care about them or didn't want to rescue them. He wanted this special people that did nothing to be a special person, by the way. If you ever wanted to pick a group of people, say, these are my promised people, you would not pick the Jews. Because every single thing that was given them to do, they did wrong or rejected or ran or rebelled, but God still used them. When we get to the end days, when we get to the final end days, God's going to turn his attention back to the nation of Israel, and more of them are going to be getting saved in those latter days. There will still be Gentiles that get saved, but the focus is going to go back. So we're in this section here where the church is being birthed, and one of the things that Paul wants to make sure that they understand was first and foremost what Jesus came to do was to be a servant to the Jews. He had to confirm the scriptures, and he started with the Jews first. First of all, Jesus was a Jew. We need to remind ourselves of that once in a while. He was not a Gentile. He kept the whole law. He honored the Sabbath. He kept the Ten Commandments. He followed the rules and regulations. He did the ceremonial. But he was pointing them to a day that was coming that those things weren't going to be needed as much at all because he was going to fulfill them. Look what it says here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 6. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So the, the original 12 were given the mission to go out to the house of Israel to proclaim the good news. We can learn a lot from this because if you're saved, one of the first things you should be working on is the people around you. Are you witnessing to them? Are you sharing with them? Are you loving on them? Or are you content that they might go burn in hell? And I hope when I say things like that, it does something right here. Because if you get so calloused, that you're so concerned with just yourself, I don't even know if you're saved. I can't judge your heart. I can't look in there. But I can tell you that if you're not burdened for lostness, then what are you doing here? Why are we even coming? It's cold outside. Let's stay inside where it's warm and, and just uh, sit back, put our feet up, and wait for Jesus to come because you're going to find out that's not how we wanted it. Church, he wants you awake. He wants you alive. He wants you to deal with different things, difficult people. When, when you think of those people close to us, you probably all have somebody in your mind, yeah, but what about him? Or I've tried with her. That's the one God wants. It's the one God loves. God rescues the people that nobody else wants. And he uses them in great and mighty ways. You see very few examples when you read your Bible of God taking a prominent person and utilizing that person. Not that he didn't. One of the things that amazes me is when I look at Jesus' ministry, one of the main fundraisers, if you will, one of the persons that was putting the money in to keep Jesus out in his ministry was from Herod's household. Herod's not exactly a clean-cut guy. He's an evil king. But God used him. And if you go and you watch when the temple's going to be rebuilt, you know, he goes back to King Xerxes. Oh, by the way, a Babylonian. And says, will you fund my project? So God can use great and mysterious people. And he was doing it throughout the scriptures. So there's a progression in these quotes. If you notice, there's a, there's a little bit of teaching in the beginning, and there's a little bit of teaching on the end in this section. There's a whole bunch of Bible references in the middle. First and foremost, this shows you why you need to read the whole Bible, doesn't it? Because if Paul is quoting somewhere, wouldn't it be nice to know where it came from? 
Want to be nice to know why it's there, and it still matters after the cross too. We're seeing that Scripture is so important. That's why we. That's why we throw this year in a Bible reading plan out. I'm not by any means saying that's the only way to read and study the Bible. I'm just giving you a tool. If you've been walking with the Lord periods of years and you haven't read the whole Bible, what's stopping you? Because you need to see all of the Bible. It's kind of like, would you, would you date somebody and only see half of their life? Well, Jesus, if you've really got a relationship with him and you really want to grow with him, you need to know everything he's, he left for you and I. So we've got to read it all. That's why it's a good overview read. That's not studying. When you read your Bible, that's giving you an overview. When you study your Bible, you slow it down. We talked about that the other week. You slow it down. You start chewing on some of it, looking at different things. So in here, we're going to see a progression. Through this section, I'm going to kind of go back and forth to you on these. So if you go first to verse 9... This first quote, for this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. What we see here is the Jews' role was to glorify God among the Gentiles. Which means your role should be to glorify God among people that don't know God. We have to carry ourselves in such a way, and that comes out of uh, Psalm 1849. Is where the quote is on that one. We have to carry ourselves in such a way where people wonder, why are you this way? But the church is becoming more and more inner-focused. One of the saddest things I think that ever happened is when when church buildings and, and church gatherings got so focused inwardly that they never have room for those outside. We always want to have outside people coming to our things. And we always want to be going to our things out there. That's why there's a um, coffee with a cop coming up. The church is going to be going to things like that. We might not bring our Bibles and, and have a sermon outline and anything to do, but if you have a Christian sitting in the room, you have a Christian view that's in the room. You don't always have influence, but you might. You might go to the library, and you might go to a coffee shop, you might go to a game place. Take Jesus with you. You have to have your ears on, your spiritual ears, to see is there an opportunity I can get in here? Is there somebody I can talk to? Is there somebody I can pray with? And don't always just get focused on, well, and my number one goal is to get them to come to Refuge Community Church, because that's not your goal. Your goal is to introduce them to Jesus Christ. And then... Your goal is to walk with somebody what's best for them and their steps. You know, one of the things that Refuge is working really hard on is this vision of, and you've heard this, mile and a half is our Jerusalem. We're being really intentional because we have to maintain our resources. That's where we want to focus. So if you, you know, you find a nursing home, let's say, in Parma Heights, Refuge isn't going there right now. We can't. We don't have those resources. You might go and you might have some friends and go and do a little study, but right down the street's deaconess. How about we go there? How about we go right into the neighborhood that God has built us to? We want to be welcoming, but we have to glorify God among the Gentiles, right? Among the lost. Is the word, another word for Gentiles, anyone not a Jew, so you can use that same analogy, anyone that's not in with Christ right now. Then you look at the second one here, which comes from Deuteronomy 32.43. Read what this second one says here. It says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Oh, so Christians and non-Christians should be together, shouldn't they? Yeah, we've got to get out of holy huddles. If, if you look at your area of influence, and you look at the people you're hanging out with, and you come up with this answer, they're all saved, you are disobedient to God. You are disobedient to God. Now, you're not supposed to get your counsel from the lost. You're not supposed to live like the lost. But you are supposed to be amongst them. You are supposed to, because how are they going to see hope? Do you think just putting a sign outside and flashing church is going to bring lost people in? No. It doesn't work. It never does. It's relationship to bring them in. Most people say that when they come to church, it's because they were invited. And I look around the room, and I can see, and I know, I don't know them all, but I know the different invites that got somebody in this room. And I know some of you have invited others that are sitting in this room. And that, that's doing the work that this section is talking about. But again, it's for the Gentiles. It's for the lost people. Because at the end of the day, salvation is for the glory of God, period, isn't it? 
You didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. You are not good enough to be saved. I am not good enough to be saved. Don't ever buy that lie. Don't ever buy that lie that once you're saved, you're good enough. You're still not good enough. You still need the hope in the grace of the gospel through the Holy Spirit. Then the third one, all the Jews and Gentiles together praise God. This is quoting Psalm 117, verse 11. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you people. Do you ever notice that we tend to try to do things to bring people together? Like, for example, when we had our Christmas concert, there was people in that room I am very confident in do not know the Lord yet by their actions, by the way they carry themselves. Now, disclaimer, Tim LaHaye and them, I wish were right, and that there would come a day where you could look out at people and you could see who's saved and who's not. It'd be a wonderful thing. you know who to focus on with the gospel and who not to. But that's not reality. It doesn't have that in the Bible. It was a fiction. It was a great writing for that Left Behind series. So what I'm saying when I say I look at people is based on the fruit I see in my eyes. None of us can tell if the person next to us is saved. Only that person in God knows if they're saved. God guarantees assurance for the believer. But he doesn't mean we can't fake it. <laughs> so that's why you're supposed to be wrestling with the Scripture. You're supposed to be examining to make sure you're in the faith. And then once you know you're in the faith, have that assurance. Don't, don't doubt that thing. Recognize when you walk away from the faith, you're being disobedient. You need to confess, repent, and come back. That's what God is wanting you to do. So this praising is there's people, like the Christmas concert, there's people there, and I saw people singing Christmas carols, and, and those songs have value, and those songs have words of salvation in them. But just because you're singing them doesn't necessarily mean you're believing them yet. But isn't it good that they were around Christians and they were seeing that? And that's what he's talking about is together they're worshiping God. You can worship God before you're saved by God. Do you know that? You can go outside and look around and say, look at this beautiful world. And you can question, how was this made? And you can even come to the conclusion, well, there must have been intelligence behind it. But until you recognize that you're dirty, that you're a sinner, that you're on your way to hell, that you can do nothing to save yourself, and you turn and you see that he's calling you and you run to Jesus... You're lost. You're lost. I'm lost. That's why we have to continually preach the gospel. I don't understand places that don't preach the gospel regularly, if not every single week, because there's no way we can possibly know if everybody in our midst is saved or not. It's a dangerous thing to start making assumptions on that. We have to share the hope. And then the last one is, is a promise of what is coming. It's coming out of the book of Isaiah, verse, chapter 11, verse 10. Look what it says here again in verse um, 12. There shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles shall hope. That is in nobody other than Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting that if you look at those quotes, you will see that he went to prophecy, you will see that he went to historical, you will, or the Pentateuch, and you will see he went to Psalms. He covered the whole entire Old Testament. So if you were a Jew, you'd be like, he got it all. Jesus, these Gentiles and Jews getting together is all throughout the Bible. Because if it, you were speaking to a Jew, the Bible is the Old Testament. That's what they would call the Bible. They don't call the New Testament. And they shouldn't until they meet Jesus. Right? Because if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're reading somebody else's mail in the New Testament. Because you need the Holy Spirit, which he promises us at salvation, which is what he gets. If we go on and we look, even as the church is being born, they use that exact same model. If you go to the book of Acts, which is one of those books I really challenge you to study. Go slow. You have to look at how they dealt with the book of Acts because it's so different then then it's the only historical book for showing the New Testament, right? But you're going to see how the church is formed, right? It starts the same way. They're in the upper room. They're all Jews in that room. And then they get told to go to the Jews first. You've got to go all the way to Acts chapter 8 
is when we're going to bring in the Samaritans. What are the Samaritans? They're the half-breeds. They got some Jewish blood in them, but they didn't live right. They intermarried. They did all these things that weren't exactly right. But, you know, they were part Jew, right? Part Jew, right? You got to go all the way to chapter 10 before the attention gets driven into the Gentiles. And that's where the focus goes. That's where Paul was called for that mission. But here's something that you and I need to thank God for. Because of Jewish Christians who were faithful to take the gospel to the Gentiles, the nations of the world today have the opportunity to meet Christ as Savior. You think about that for a moment? Because of Jewish Christians taking the gospel to another group, you and I have an opportunity, which is a challenge for you and I. Because of you giving up your priorities for somebody other's priorities to be met, people will get saved. You know, if you think about a, you think about a, a church, there's so many things that go on in the church. There's teaching. There's buildings. There's payroll. There's gas. There's, there's plumbing. There's electrical. There's all of these things, right? And if we're not careful, things can replace the main thing. And I've seen this in many, many places. This building is a hospital. It's not a museum. So when you look at things, I want you to look at things through lost people's eyes. You're sitting, some of you, in chairs. That was a six-year prayer. For six years, when, when, when Refuge was birthed and I was casting vision to the North American Mission Board and I walked in this door, the first thing I said to Brent is, the pew's got to go. And I know there's some going, why? Looks like a church. Show me. Show me. You know where Jesus preached? Well, in a boat, in a desert, out in the wilderness. The chairs are to make lost people comfortable to come in to hear the good news. That's what we want. You're going to see this room have weddings in it. You're going to see this room have opportunities to do different things so we can rub shoulders with lost people. We're going to get there today, actually. It's in my message, so thank you. So he would do and he would meet. That's our goal. Our goal. It's, it's like, and, and it's not one, what's neat about God is he gives a vision. My role as a planter, as starting a new work was, yeah, I had to take the reins and, and go, and then you kind of have to look behind. Is anybody following in that? But he's brought people around that vision. Like, for instance, I don't know the color of these chairs. They've told me. I'm colorblind. I don't understand the color of those walls. I don't see it. But I have people that are in the vision, that are in the leadership, that get to take that ball and run. And that's what our minds have to be focused. Because we're never going to be that place where we're going to try to make everybody happy. Because you just can't do it. It's physically impossible. And to be honest, I don't want to. I want to lead people to Jesus, and that's where I want to lead us. Are we leading them to Jesus? Because Jesus then starts changing them. There's things already going on in, in ministry and going on in my life that I'm not always comfortable with, right? If he wanted me to be comfortable, he would just taken me out of here, right? Because this world is still broken. But we have to see that because we're, our goal here is to receive others as Christ received us. That's what it says there at the beginning. He gives all these quotes to show how Jesus is his servant, but he wants us to understand it's as people come to Christ that we receive them as they are, and then we work on discipling them. Now, discipling them is not getting them to conform to your Christian walk, because there's only one you. We've been taking time about that's where that strong and that weak thing comes in. So we have to be willing to look and, and really make this one question our priority. Is what that individual doing disallowed in the Bible or allowed in the Bible? Right? So, so they come into the church and they smoke a cigarette once in a while. Do we need to go beat them over the head and make them quit tomorrow? No. No. 
Do we know that health-wise it'd be good to quit smoking? Yes, I testify that I was 20-some cigarettes a day and God delivered me from that. It became a sin to me. But if we start trying to clean people up rather than get them in love with Jesus, we're doing it no different than a Pharisee who just nailed you with rules and regulations and things like that. But if we get them to walk with Jesus, he's going to change things. Is there anybody that realistically can say, I've been walking for Jesus for a long period, and he's done nothing in my life, but I'm going to heaven? I would challenge you to go back and read the gospel. Because it's easy here to, to say I'm a saved person. It's easy to check a box. It's easy to walk an aisle if you think about it. It's easy to ask for prayer to receive Christ. It's another thing to live it. Because one of the things you notice when you're living it for Christ, it's not going to go your way. And he wants you to obey him. He wants you to trust him. Galatians 3, 28, 29. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Boy, the Jews didn't like that. Because they were the promised people, right? They were the ones. You know, they, they had the oracles of God given to them, if you were. But if we look back, we will see that in those oracles and in those things that were given, there's a lot of warts along the way. You know, Abraham is credited as, you know, the faith of Abraham, right? You hear about Abraham had righteousness and all that. You have to go and look at Abraham. I mean, he, he lies twice. That's not my wife. That's my sister. That's a lie. That's a very serious lie. <laughs> He is promised by God that a promised child is coming and he starts to get old. And then he says, well, that, that makes great sense. You're going to let me have sex with my head? Yeah, sure, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll move God's agenda along. Anybody ever try to move God's agenda along? We all sometimes do. We'll get frustrated. That's, that's how I think you found the seeker-sensitive church movement, if you think about it. Because the seeker-sensitive movement that came out was we'll do whatever it takes, we'll compromise the gospel out here, we'll water it down, we'll do whatever to get them to hear Jesus. No, you can't change the gospel. That's why I said we want them comfortable to come in because we promise to teach the truth. And if we're not teaching the truth, that's why membership is so important, right? Because when we covenant together in membership, what we're saying is this is guiding us. So in, in, in some ways, my priority is members. You understand that? My priority is the members, and their priority should be that we're making sure that we're lockstep with the gospel. Because those are the ones we can submit to authority to together. Now others that profess to be Christians, we can take them to the truth, but they're not covenant with us the same way because they're choosing to not be under the authority of a local gathering. And there could be many reasons. I'm not trying to say you have to be a member of a church or any. You should be. I think the scriptures is clear you should be. And I think there's victory and I think there's strength because that's when you're giving all your time, talent, and treasures to that movement, uniting in a vision and saying, yes, this is where God has me. Where otherwise, I think you're in consumerism in a lot of ways. I'll help what I want. I'll help what I need. I'll give my resources how I want to give my resources. I don't want to submit, I don't want to trust that God has a vision. That's what you're doing when you do it your way. And we all do this. This is a battle every one of us has in every aspect of our life. Because we miss the point sometimes of the gospel. The gospel is he came to save sinners. You know, as you watch football, just start counting again. You're going to see on that goal post, you're going to see the John, you're going to see the three, and you're going to see the 16. It's a great subliminal message, right? You're, we're, we're hoping people know what that means. But I think they missed 17. Because 17 is really the key to 16. I want to read them both to you again to remind you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
When's the last time you started liking your enemies again? God's not mad at them. While they're here on planet Earth, God's goal is he wants them to come to a saving faith. God created them in his image. So we've said it for months now. What are we doing for Planned Parenthood? God loves the director of Planned Parenthood. God can rescue the director of Planned Parenthood and transform the director of Planned Parenthood and save the director of Planned Parenthood. But if the church is smug on her, or him, I don't even know if it's a male or female right now, but is judgmental of her, is condemning of her, the church is saying, you're not worth saving. You're not like me. And God is saying, have you looked at what you were like before you met Jesus Christ? That one makes the news. That one's, that one's easy to see, so, so to speak, right? But realistically, all of us were just as dirty and as vile and on our way to hell. We have to remember that hell is real and that there are many, many, many going in that direction. That's why the gospel is so simple, but yet so complicated, isn't it? It's simple in that you have to do nothing, right? You have to admit God's done everything, and you have to go to him. Simple. Except when you look at what go to him really means, right? Because God is not offering you, you know, we're going to look at Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It does not say there that if you say a simple prayer and you check a simple box, no, because it says you have to believe. And then in verse 10, for the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What does that mean, that word righteousness? It's critical that it's in there. It means you're going to be conformed into the image of God, which means you're going to have to become obedient to God, which means you're going to have to get messy, which means you're going to have to give things up, which means you need to surrender. It's not just a, yeah, Lord, I don't want to go to hell. I mean, do you think there's any, do you think Adolf Hitler, as he was dying, however he dies, right? He shot himself, ran away, who knows, who cares, right? At the end of his day, when he stood before his creator, do you think he's going to say, but I just want to go to heaven. You don't think he's going to think that? You bet he's going to think that. And you bet that majority of people, majority of people that have sat in churches that you know, are going to come to a day and they're going to go to hell too. A majority of them. I don't know the exact ones. You don't know the exact ones. But there's so many that have said, I just went to church. You'll ask questions. That's why one of the things about membership, again, is in this covenant, is we, we ask some questions. Because we're not going to let somebody join a church that says, why should you join the church? Well, because I've always went to church. Because I was baptized. Because I got a big fat bank account. Because I've been to the Congo. None of that <laughs> saves you. The answer to that question is because Jesus died for me. You know, now, I'm not giving you the answer because I promise you when Jeff's doing, he's going to make sure you're not just giving the Sunday school answer, right? We want to know what that really means. And that's the best we can do, <laughs> right? Because we have all these resources at our expo disposal now, so... If we're that kind of person that just wants to know the right answer, we can study, so to speak, and not mean it. But our fruit should show that out over time. And that's, that's that discipline factor as we walk together that we submit to the Scriptures. It's not, and I think this is the hardest part with this, it's not going to make sense to be a Christian. Have you ever noticed that? There's a lot of things that go on that you're like, What? That's one of the parts of the obedience. Does it make sense? I'm going to give you two stories straight out of the Scripture, right? First one is Matthew 14. We're just going to take verses 29 through 31. Jesus is walking on the water. David stole this from me already, but we're going to finish it anyways. It, 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 Jesus says to Peter, come. That's all he says, one word, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, so we got obedience, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, how many people have walked on water that you know of? This is the only one I know of, right? Right in the Scripture. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and he began to sink. He cried out, saying, Lord, save me. He 
took his eye off Jesus and he went down like a rock. And he was starting to go into the water and potentially drowned. Right? That was what was happening. Does it make sense to get out of a boat and walk on water? No. But he was obedient. He's calling us to that level of obedience. I think the, the example in the Old Testament I want to take you to is a guy named Abraham. And Abraham, first in Genesis 22, we're going we're to go through another assignment. I gave you the book of Acts. Take your time reading. Another place is read Genesis chapter 22. Because I think it's a very important section of Scripture for our faith. But look what it says in verse 2. God says to Abraham, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Approximately, Abraham's about 113, 114 years old when this is being said. Because at about 100 is when the promised son came. Remember I told you that he had the handmaiden and they had made Ishmael? Well, that wasn't the promised child. And then we do have the promise come forward, and that is Isaac. And he's, he's, in, he's about a teenager at this time, okay? And he says... I want you to take that teenager. I want you to go to Land Moriah. And I want you to offer him as a burnt offering. God says, I want you to kill your son. What does Abraham do? We see in verse 10. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. So my question to you, what is he asking you to kill? What are you holding on to? That God is saying, I want to do great and I want to do mighty things but you're not willing to give me this. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's a building. And God is saying, do you trust me? Because what Abraham knew, and if you were to read through that whole section, he even tells his 13-year-old son, who, by the way, willingly goes and willingly gets on an altar. That's another sermon for another day. Because 113 verse 13, which one you betting on? <laughs> You know, if that kid wanted out of there, there's no way this old man was going to win that battle. I, I don't think I won it in my 50s, right? But what Abraham said is, God will provide the sacrifice. He believed and trusted God so much that if he took his life, he believed he'd resurrected him right then and there and he'd be alive again. Because he believed there was this promise. And at 13 years old, Isaac didn't have any kids. So it's kind of hard to keep the thing going, if you haven't gotten married yet. But he trusted him. So that's what we have to do. The dagger is raised. And God is saying, I want you to give that up. I want you to trust me in this area. I want you to believe. It's not going to look right. That didn't look right. Don't ever think that Abraham's like, cool, I get to sacrifice my son. No, it wasn't that kind of a rebellious teenager that sometimes we get there, right? We've all had that day where it's like, yeah, maybe I'll give my teenager up for a moment. But we're not really going to take a knife and kill him, most of us. But he knew. He knew this was an important moment. And he trusted him. And I believe he wants us to do the same thing. I don't know what it is for us. Each and every one of us have to get with God and say, Lord, what is it that I have to have my way? Or I get stuck in this area. Or it looks to look this way. Or I don't want anyone to know about this thing. And he's saying, I want that thing to die. You're like, but, but Lord, if that dies, and he's like, I got this. I got this. And for some of us, it might just be having the faith to do this. He's going to stop before you even get it dead. And others, he's going to say, I'm going to take that away from you, and you're going to look back. You know, for me, it's 1989. The Browns go 3-13. and 13. They called it the season from hell that year. They fired the coach in the middle of the year. I was working at a restaurant called DJ's. I was living in Fairview Park with my grandmother at the time. You see, part of the story of why I didn't want to be here was mom and dad still lived here. I didn't want nothing to do with mom and dad. I was an 18, 19-year-old kid. I was going to church. I could quote you Bible, but I didn't want them. 
I had a grandma. Anybody ever manipulate a grandma against a dad? <laughs> yeah. My grandma just wanted to love her grandkids. So I was living with her. My grandfather died about 10 months before that. Living with her. And at halftime of the Browns versus the Bengals, I come home and she's dead on the couch with an aneurysm. Dead. Thank the Lord it was a quick take, 89 years old. And I'm standing in this funeral home. And everybody knows the divide between me and my mom and dad. And, and, and how, you know, I had plans. I had seven friends. We all agreed we were paying the rent. We were keeping the house. Who wouldn't logically want to stay in Fairview Park in a house that was already paid for rather than move back to Cleveland, Ohio on Valley Road? I mean, it's a logical thing, right? I mean, I had a beautiful house out there. My dad's like, we're selling it. I'm like, I got seven guys. We're not taking your money. We're selling it. And that was a crossroads for me. Because I had to go back home. I had to restore my relationship with my mom. I had to go to college. I had to get closer to the Lord. None of that happens unless I was obedient. I could have tried many other ways, but God just, I remember in that funeral home, everybody asked me, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know, but I just know God's got it. And he restored a lot of things. He showed me that I was a lot of the problem. Because you see, a lot of times when we're in that flesh, we don't know where the problem is. We can see what's wrong, we can see what's broken, but we don't realize our part in it. And our part usually is we're holding on to things. We're prideful of things we like. It might be the past. We like how things used to be. It's a good thing we don't have the past and being all shepherds right now, huh? It'd be cold here in Cleveland, Ohio. But God had a plan. Because at the end of the day, the whole reason for the whole entire Bible is to glorify God and depend on his mercy so we can abound in hope. Look at what it says again in verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to not be focused on now. He wants us to be focused on there. So whatever we endure right now, yes, there will be trials. Yes, there will be tribulations. Yes, there will be tests. That is for all Christians. Yes, the lost go through the exact same things. They just don't have a source to run to. Because the purpose when they're going through their trials and their tribulations is to get them to look up. The purpose when we're going is we should know that to rely on the Holy Spirit that we have. We can rely on God in the midst of the storm. That's why it's so dangerous when we preach certain portions of the scripture, right? You can take the trials out. You can take the tribulations out. You can take the temptations out. But then you don't have a Bible. Because I can't find anywhere in this book, I mean, from cover to cover. It's another reason I like reading it every year. I can't find anywhere where I got a guy going, I want to be that guy. Even Joseph. I mean, I'm in, I'm in that story right now, and I'm like, Joseph married a woman that was a priestess daughter. Going, why would he want that religion in his household? And there's going to be consequences for that that Joseph goes through. You know, and Joseph, I mean, yes, he was in bondage, and yes, he was obedient. There's some weak traits we can learn, but that isn't who I'm supposed to be like. I'm supposed to be like this one guy only. His name is Jesus Christ. And he gave everything away. And he was willing to die for me. And he was willing to love me even when I didn't deserve to be loved. So that is the hope of this message through the power of the Holy Spirit. So as we closed, two times of confession that I want us to have today. And these are just your own time to think about. But if there's something that the Lord gives you on this and you want to share it with leadership, I invite you to please call me. Let's do coffee. Call me, or send me an email. I can respond. But the first one is, is refuge looked at to outsiders as a place of refuge? Right? Because that's an important thing that we want. As you go back through those four, we want to bring that lost people in here so they can meet the Lord Jesus. How are we doing that? Or is there other, maybe God don't have another idea. Why do we do this? Why do we do that? You know, I can't promise that you have an idea and we always say yes. I mean, because there's this team and there's different people on different components of that team, you know. Dan's a plumber. You know, you might come to me and say we need a jacuzzi and I might have to go to the plumber and he might be like, Don, we don't have a floor that fits it or we don't have a 220 line. 
Or, yeah, we can do it. I don't know any of that stuff. Boy, that was good that I quoted some plumbing stuff. But, but that's, that's what I'm talking about. I can't have everybody on that team. I got a plumber. That's his problem. <laughs> I got one for you about a dishwasher. I got to talk to you later. So that's the first one. The second one is, are we providing refuge to the insiders? Or are we just taking care of physical needs? Because God has not called refuge to be a food bank. God has not called refuge to be a clothing shelter. God has called us to be discipling and witnessing and sending out. And when we're doing other things, we need to evaluate. So if you hear, if the Lord's speaking on those, bring them to our attention. And then go this week in the hope of the gospel. Let's pray. Father God, I do thank you. Lord, I thank you for those Jewish Christians so long ago that cared enough to be obedient, to take it to their enemies, to take it to the nations of the world that had put their thumb on Israel for so long. But they recognized that there was change in the gospel. Lord, I don't know if everybody in this room, I don't know if everybody that's watching us on YouTube is saved. I'm never going to assume that. So Lord, if right now you're drawing somebody, that person is so tired of doing it their own way, and they want to run to truth, I pray that they will just call out to Jesus. The Bible tells us in Romans 10 again that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that you raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. So Lord, I pray for that decision if anyone makes it, and then I pray that they will have the courage to admit it. They will tell somebody. Lord, because the church has a role to walk with them and nurture them and care for them. So Lord, we want to know when you have somebody been added to your roles. So Lord, then help us to walk. Help us to receive new Christians. Help us to disciple new Christians. And help us to never get comfortable with just the group we have. Let there always be room at the table. Lord, I do pray that if you're speaking to our hearts of things we need to let go of, that we lay those at your feet. You don't promise the getting away from sin. You don't promise the getting away from difficulty is always easy. There was a 70-year captivity that Israel had to go through to come back to the land. And even then, they still had idolatry to deal with. So Lord, help us to get alone with you, to hear from you clearly, and to be obedient to you. And Lord, give us, give us a heart to pray for others. Give us a desire to see those that don't know you and that come to know you. And then Lord, let us walk. In Jesus' name, amen. I can still see the steeple A little church on the hill There was a line at the altar Every pew had been filled I remember the water The choir singing old hymns There was peace in the valley Oh, as the preacher man said In the name of the Father In the name of the Son In the name of the Spirit Washed by the blood Buried with Christ Raise a new life, baptize. I can still hear the sermon. All the people said amen. There was a gift of salvation. You could be born again. I remember the power, the Holy Spirit rushing in. There was peace like a river. 
Oh, and the preacher man said, in the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Spirit, you're washed by the blood, buried with Christ, raised a new life, baptized. Well, those old stained glass windows and the stories they tell, all the memories are clear as the day I was there. All those years I spent running, you're giving me back. Now I'm stepping in, I'm stepping in, I'm stepping in. In the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Spirit, you're washed by the blood, buried with Christ, raised a new life, baptized. In the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Spirit, you're washed by the blood, buried with Christ, raised a new life, baptized. I can still see the steeple, a little church on the hill. Thank you for being with us this Sunday. On Wednesday, there is Bible studies. Next Friday, we have services, 7 o'clock, Bible study Sunday morning, and then back here, God willing, at 11 o'clock. Have a blessed week. Please stay warm, stay safe. God bless you. Have a good weekend.